was wrongfully in prison. There's a stigma that goes with that and still goes with that. I still get abuse from certain members of the public. I still get scoffed at, etc. People don't know the full story. They think I'm some sort of psycho, some sort of mentally ill patient. I had done nothing wrong, I was innocent. And I protested my innocence from the word go. For nearly 11 and a half, 12, nearly 12 years, I was protesting my innocence consistently, continually, because it was the truth. Lunch. He would often tell me that he never resolved his anger. He was always angry about the um, police and the prosecutors that brought the injustice. And God. Andrew was probably not for this planet. I mean, the, the bad luck that he had. Good, not good, Andrew. He was just not a soul that belonged here in some ways. The Greeks talk about the goddess Clotho who spins people's fate. Clotho was spinning against Andrew from the get-go. This whole story is like some Greek tragedy. The audience sort of think this is going well and then it all just turns to mud. It was about five o'clock in the afternoon and that day was the day of a big freak storm. Everyone in Perth remembered it for this terrible weather that suddenly came in. Shops were closing up around Glyde Street in Mosman Park where Pamela Lawrence had a little jewellery store. Pamela's husband, Peter Lawrence, went down to the shop and realised that she had been bludgeoned in a very, very violent attack. The paramedics brought Mum out of the shop on a stretcher and into the back of the ambulance. I saw her, she was just bandaged. She, her face looked beautiful as usual. She's just in a, in a usual jumper and jeans and she just looked like she was asleep but with a, with a bandage around her head. When I got home, I called the hospital and um, the nurse that answered the phone said to me that they'd stop CPR because they couldn't do anything. And then I had to go and tell my sister, um, which was probably the worst moment of my life. Spread out again, OK? So we don't miss any ground at all. Understandably, there was a very big manhunt that went on immediately for who may have killed this woman who didn't seem to have an enemy in the world. There was 136 initially on the suspect list because someone had seen someone in the window, a man, and there was an identikit description put out. And uh, so the police amassed a large number of suspects, and Andrew Mallard was one of those suspects. <laughs> I was down on my luck, I was vulnerable, I was living on the streets, I was trying to survive. Brian Ferry just got married to a 25-year-old. I was suffering from a nervous breakdown, basically, and uh, I was so embarrassed by this situation that I didn't want to approach my family for help, so I tried to make it on my own. I so I'm not unusual, am I? No, of course you're not. He hadn't been eating, he'd been smoking pot and... Um, Living rough, I mean, he, he just was not normal at that time, not what you call stable anyway. He wasn't stable. It's not difficult to see how Andrew became a suspect in the first place. He'd had a bit of a mental breakdown. He was acting quite erratically and ended up in Greylands Psychiatric Hospital as a result of some of the things he was doing, including some sort of petty crime and thievery and um, one occasion where he pretended to be a police officer and uh, broke into a flat. So he went in for 21 days. Uh, whilst in hospital, he was then interviewed by the police. He was not offered the public advocate or anyone from legal aid, or indeed he didn't even have a mental health nurse with him. You're asking a mental patient in a psychotic condition as to his exact movements at a specific time, some two or three weeks before. So over a period of two or three days, they excluded what Andrew was putting forward as alibi evidence and then came back and said, you're a liar. 
And do you realise why you're here? After Andrew was released what from the psychiatric institution, uh, within hours of his release from there, he was put straight into a police interview room with Detective Caporn, and he was there for eight hours. At that point, I knew he was looking at me as the murderer, and this is when I have started to protest my innocence. I said, look, I've had nothing to do with that. I've had nothing to do with that murder. I'm innocent. When are you going to stop lying to us? None of that was recorded, and out they came saying, we've got a confession. It always seemed strange that while they said that he confessed during that first eight-hour period, they let him out on the street. And during that week of, of uh, brief, um, confused, dazed freedom, uh, I'm approached by a, a man introducing himself as Gary. Uh, Gary was actually, I now know, an undercover officer. The undercover officer took Andrew about Fremantle, uh, bought him hotel rooms, bought him alcohol, supplied him with a bong, uh, and on Andrew's account, cannabis. And he was really fueling this mania. When they brought him back a week later, back into the same interview room, sat there for another couple of hours with him and then decided to put him on video. We brought you in this morning and we had a conversation in relation to the murder of Pamela Lawrence at Mosman Park. Do you agree with that? I do. I had, uh, over the course of my life, suffered from a uh, behavioural situation where I was... Um, I would always acquiesce. I would uh, uh, try to please people. I was a people pleaser. And you told us that um, you went in the rear... went in through the rear of the shop at Flora Metallica. Is that what you told us? I told you that. OK, OK, I'm just going to go through that now, OK? What you told us. All right, we'll sort the rest out later, OK? And there were just very leading questions from the detective, trying to get Andrew to agree with things that he was saying. Um, and really so much of it just was clearly theorising. You described the steps to us and you described the rear door and the fly screen door. You did. May I say yeah. something else? OK, yeah, go on. If Pamela Lawrence was locking the store up, Maybe she came in through the back way and the front door was already locked. Maybe. Okay. Yep. And she left the key in the, in the back door and that's why he had easy access that's and that's right. why she didn't okay. hear him until he was much we'll in the We'll go on with what you told us earlier, OK, before we go into anything else. We found a lot of the information that he was giving in that video interview and in earlier interviews was information fed to him by the undercover officer and fed to him by the detectives that were interviewing him. The fact is that you told us all these things and you now say that that was a complete pack of lies, that all that things that you told us was... I say that is my, my version, my conjecture of the of what? scene of the crime. OK, no worries. We'll leave it at that. End of story. Thanks very much. Next thing we knew, we had a telephone call from a policeman to say they'd arrested Andrew for murder. Today, a breakthrough. Major Crime Squad have today charged Andrew Mark Mallard, 31 years of age, with the willful murder of the death of Pamela Suzanne Lawrence. I couldn't believe what, you know, I, Andrew, Andrew's not violent. He was not a violent person, never was. He was a very gentle type of person. And, you know, they just floored us. Dad and Amy and I attended most of the trial. Ken Bates, the prosecutor, set my family at ease. He was confident that they had the right person. The whole of the case was based on these so-called confessions. The jury heard that although Mallard had twice confessed to the murder, but had later retracted both confessions, there were 15 things he'd told police that only the killer would have known. There was no DNA, there were no fingerprints, there was no blood. Despite this being a horrendously bloody scene, there was nothing forensically at all. The most damning single piece of evidence against Andrew at trial and when he was later trying to get his convictions overturned was this Sid Chrome wrench drawing that he'd done during the unrecorded part of the police interview. We now know, having heard the body wire tapes of Gary, the undercover officer, 
that Sid Chrome and the wrench was all discussed during that undercover operation that we never knew anything about. And the prosecutor said, with this wrench, he killed her. And Andrew was quickly convicted. Mallard, 33, continued to protest his innocence throughout the sentencing hearing, frequently interjecting. Outside the court, Mallard's father also protested his son's innocence. We know my son is Andrew is innocent of this terrible crime. The, mur the real murderer is still free. I got a phone call one day from Grace Mallard and as a last resort, I suppose, they came to me working as a journalist to try and investigate the case and find fresh evidence. When I was reading the transcript, I really couldn't believe that anyone could be convicted on the evidence that Andrew was convicted on. In 2002, I'd already been looking at this case for four years. Andrew was getting quite desperate. I was working as a political journalist and in my former life as a court reporter, John Quigley was one of the best known and smartest lawyers in town. And John Quigley had joined with the Labor Party, the backbench of the government. I had four about 25 or 30 years been the uh, council of choice for the Western Australian Police Union in Perth. That's a box oh. for you. Hi, Colleen. This is the first of it, is it? Yeah, got more in the car. Taking the case to John Quigley was a huge risk, mostly because he had worked for all that time for the police. But really, it turned out to be the best thing that we could ever have done. Yeah within months of taking the case to John Quigley, we had breakthroughs. I'm at the page here where Brandon, Detective Sergeant Brandon, goes down to Fremantle and arrests Andrew shortly after 8 o'clock in the morning on a Friday. He saw things in the transcript that I didn't see because he understood police procedure so well. Well, what I mean by that is Brandon knows where he is. There'll have been an undercover operation running. He could also get access to things that I just couldn't get access to as a journalist. I indicated to the Attorney General of the day, Mr McGinty, that I was about to make a big speech in Parliament. The Attorney General then, perhaps in an effort to avoid such a controversial speech being made, uh, came to an agreement the DPP would lay on the table the whole of their file, including their correspondence file, their litigation file. The DPP took me straight to a file and said, the prosecutor's brought this file up to me and has marked this page and said, this should have been shown to the defence, this should have been shown to the court, and he's looking very ill, the prosecutor, but you should read it now. And I was just stunned. I thought, what is this page? Do you say that things should be done differently in the At trial, the prosecutor, Mr Bates, had said on over 80 occasions that Andrew Mallard had murdered Pamela Lawrence by beating her about the head with a wrench. Whilst he was speaking those words, he had on his file on bar table a report which said that they'd done a test on a pig's head which had convinced the pathologist that a wrench could not have inflicted those injuries. This was crucial evidence in the trial, which he'd had all the while, which he'd marked, so he'd read and had kept it from the court. This was uh, something that a lawyer should never, ever do. And in fact, in the, uh, the uh, statement of facts to the prosecution, certain police officers st state their concerns that they don't think that I was the murderer anyway. That's in the, the statement of facts to the prosecution. Now, Jackie and I and Quigley went to the prison to see Andrew. And of course, Quigley, being an MP, got a special room for us. I went in there and I said, I know your son's innocent. I did something I hadn't done with a client before. I, I hugged him and I hu hugged him as hard as I could. And I said, I will never, ever leave you. No matter how long this takes, 
It's the rest of your life. I will never leave you. Andrew Mallard's family came to court for the first day of his appeal, hoping the judges will agree he was wrongfully convicted. We found original statements of witnesses just didn't correspond with the evidence of their second statements and even third statements that were presented in court. So it really showed a pattern of manipulation of evidence against Andrew Mallard. I'd just like to say that the wrong man is in jail, that this is an injustice. I never had any anger towards Andrew's family, but the team of people that were helping him, I felt like they must have their own agendas. We had high profile people from the police and the prosecution that were still confident they had the right person. It didn't occur to us that, that the justice system could have failed so dismally. It was claimed Mallard hit the mother of two with a wrench and drew a picture of the weapon for police. Today, defence lawyer Malcolm McCusker QC said his client provided the drawing after being stripped naked and beaten by police. Here's a man that's been in jail now for 11 years and the High Court has said it's because the police and prosecution suppressed evidence. Detective Sergeant Sherville and Detective uh, Constable Caporn and now, of course, Assistant Commissioners sit around the command table. Anything in the brief that didn't fit with their theory that Mallard was the murderer, they simply went back to a witness and got them to change the statement. I just let them know and they said he, he knows, so... All right, so do we go in the, in the, in the, in the gatehouse or what? I don't know. Yeah, we're we'll going to try and go in there. I was so angry. Everybody was furious. They still would not admit that they got it wrong. After 12 years, Andrew was finally getting out of jail, but they still had to just dig it in and claim that he was still guilty. The day that Andrew was released was a very difficult day for our family because at that stage we still believed that he was guilty. I was terrified at the thought of him being released and being out there walking around in Perth that we may bump into him. I didn't know how he'd react. I, I was really scared at, at that thought. Uh, I just want a good night's sleep, free from... Um, Officers viewing me in the port and keys jangling and all that sort of thing. I just want to be able to sleep in peace. Well, I've had three years, nearly four years, of psychotherapy to deal with post-traumatic stress. So if someone is found innocent after they've been wrongfully convicted, there's no provision in the system for that. You're just spat out. You're spat out of the belly of the beast, so to speak, and left to fend for yourself. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh my God. Oh, that's better. I yeah, can see who you are. <laughs> when I was first released, I used to have a tremendous panic attacks. And you have to remember, I was called a prime suspect at that time, too, so people used to give me a wide berth anyway. And Andrew would have lived for the rest of his life with this hanging over his head. So uh, myself in the newspaper, John Quigley in the parliament, Malcolm McCusker in press conferences really put a lot of pressure on the police service to have another look at this case. And they finally agreed to do a cold case review. Police have enlisted the help of British forensic expert David Barclay. The physical evidence review looks at everything possible that we could get from all of the items and then tries to map them across onto all the scenarios and all the people. New digital technology has matched a palm print found on a glass cabinet in her Mosman Park jewellery store to a man currently in jail for another violent crime believed to be a murder. Uh, it is a new development. It is a significant development. The palm print that the cold case reviewer was shown led him to Simon Rochford, who was serving life for the murder of his girlfriend, whom he had murdered but seven short weeks after the murder of Pamela Lawrence. 
Significantly, both women had identical injuries in their heads, and it was caused not by a Sid Chrome wrench, but by a very strange and makeshift instrument that Simon Rochford had made and then used to kill both women. Moreover, Dr Cook, during the autopsy of the late Pamela Lawrence, had recovered from her head some shavings of blue paint. And no one knew where this blue paint had come from. But it was an exact match to fragments of blue paint still in Simon Rochford's knapsack that the police still had after all these years, the knapsack in which he'd kept the murder weapon. Today, the release of a cold case review finding the 44-year-old had played no part in the 1994 murder of Pamela Lawrence. Mr Mallard spent 12 years in prison for a crime we think he didn't commit. He's no longer a person of interest. And I've apologised to him for any part that the WA police may have played in that. The last thing any of us would have wanted, and especially the last thing Mum would have wanted, was for the wrong person to be punished over her death. The Triple C has recommended disciplinary action against Assistant Police Commissioners Mal Sherval and Dave Caporn and Senior DPP lawyer Ken Bates. Each of them were allowed to leave with all of their entitlements. And while they have gone through the suffering of their reputations, and I recognise that that is punishment for them, they haven't been made to face the consequences in the way that Andrew certainly would like to see. That's you and your mum. That's right, it's me and my mum. Do you know her name? Yeah. I'm not allowed. I'm going to keep this picture. You want to keep it? I have right. enormous regrets at how long it took me to realise that Andrew was innocent. I really want people to know that my family believe Andrew's innocent 100%. And we have nothing but regret for what he's been, been put through and what his family and, and his supporters have gone through. Um, and if it wasn't for them, we would never have, I don't think we'd ever have known the truth. So it's been really difficult and it's still difficult for me now, but I have to say I'm much, much better and I'm coping very well. Mm. These people need to be made accountable for their actions. In my view, uh, there was a conspiracy to pervert the course of justice. This is a crime. You are a better police officer than they are. Why should these people be above the law? Is this a democracy or a fascist state? I ask you. I met Andrew shortly after his release from prison and he was referred to me for art therapy. I extended a hand of friendship, my partner and I, and he would often come out with us to social events, art exhibitions, parties, and he really, that was the happiest I'd seen him. He was connecting and he felt that he belonged. <laughs> he was a bit of a larrikin, so he used to make us laugh. <laughs> He ended up getting compensation, $3.25 million. How are you? Yeah, I'm cool. It's odd that he actually was happier before he got the money. Here's to Andrew. He was very reckless with his spending. It was like there was no tomorrow. He was always buying the latest thing. You know, he bought an Aston Martin and, and then he sold that. And he said to me, money doesn't make you happy. <laughs> All he wanted was to find love and have a family of his own, and nothing else mattered. Andrew was always looking for that one, for that soulmate, for that one that was going to be the love of his life, and wanting to reclaim those years that he lost. I mean, he, he lost most of his 30s and part of his 40s. He did a degree in fine arts. He did quite well. He sold a few pieces. There seemed a theme in his art in that, you know, he's in a fetal position. This is how often he felt in prison, isolated, wounded, lonely. He never really got rid of that wound. He, it was always there. He'd always go back to it. 
I used to tell my clients when I was a defence lawyer that even after a verdict of not guilty, they'd still be stained by the allegation. It's like spilling beetroot on yourself. You can't quite get the stain off it. There's always a remnant stain upon your character. It was difficult for Andrew because he was so recognisable in Perth and he was sort of infamous. After he got his compensation, there would be people who were trying to get money out of him. So he really wanted to be anonymous and then decided that he was going to go over to England. Do you want to smile just a little bit? Or put your... <laughs> Andrew always thought the grass was going to be greener on the other side. And he would go there, but he'd face different issues and, and he'd always come back feeling more troubled and disillusioned. Um, and then he'd say, oh, I think Perth is my home. This is where I belong, my family, my friends. How many bags are you checking in today? One. He painted pictures for me and brought them around and inscribed lovely um, things on the back of them. To Colleen, I am forever grateful for your help and the kindness you gave is an example to me that I can pass on to someone else in life. My heart is stronger for knowing you. And that was the last time I saw him. Yeah, this is just such a sad story for so many reasons, Pat. You have to understand that Andrew Mallard spent more than a decade behind bars after being convicted of a crime he didn't commit. He was out. He was living his life. He was crossing this street here in Hollywood when injustice hit him for a second time. I got woken up by a phone call by a senior policeman who rang and told me that Andrew had been in a fatal accident in California and it was a hit and run. He checks both ways and crosses the famous Sunset Strip. Then a sudden flash of headlights. The driver doesn't stop. I can't tell you how uh, the feeling of grief that washed over me. I held that man in my arms in prison and promised I'd never leave him. I felt just a little bit of me die when I heard this news. And had been rebuilding his life when it was tragically cut short. I dropped the phone out of my hand. I could not believe it. And he, you know, he's written to me to say he was well and he's happy. Andrew's family always loved him. He had called them just the night before and said that he was getting married, that he'd met a girl and that he was totally in love. They are obviously very devastated. Grace is 92 years old now. I'm still processing it. And I'm thinking, well, maybe the universe had other plans for him. Maybe the grass is now greener on the, on the other side for him. Andrew was a gentleman, an honest person. I just think it's so unfair, so sad what happened. I'd like to think that Andrew's soul is resting in peace. Mm -hmm.